All right. Good afternoon from Singapore. Also a big hello to everyone as well who might be dialing in from other places around the globe. Thank you and welcome to today's session where we'll be talking about preparing for factories of tomorrow. My name is Wei Min from SG Novit, and for those who may know, SG Novit is a government-backed deep tech investor and company builder whose mission is to help entrepreneurial scientists build deep tech startups that are looking to solve big global problems. Our work also involves building a global community of leaders, thinkers, and doers to drive and scale up deep tech innovations in areas such as AI, healthcare, quantum tech, and autonomous technology across various industries. For today, we encourage all attendees to share with us your thoughts on the topic or interact with our speakers by posting in the Q&A tab located at the bottom panel of your screen. Otherwise, feel free to just say hi and do a quick shout out from where you are in the chat box below. Now, when we say factories of tomorrow, what comes to your mind? Is it fully automated production lines where robots does all the work from assembly to packing and then shipping? Or is it a place where you see, you know, balanced humans, machines coming together to drive um, production efficiency and yield? Now, I do not think we are in a world where everything can be done in just by pressing a button. In fact, you need a human pressing that button for things to run. My, my point is, um, when we talk about factories of tomorrow, we're referring to the whole manufacturing industry gearing to adopt the whole 5.0 model. Utilizing technologies across full spectrum of things like IIoT, machine learning, AI, visual computing, automation, digital twinning, and many more. And this covers many areas across factory operations, which helps save cost and effort for factory owners. With the right technology applied, we are talking about um, predictive maintenance, uh, smart energy consumption, data demand prediction, and many more. Now, back to the question, where does humans come to the picture then? Which is why today we have uh, three esteemed speakers with us, all experts in their own field in manufacturing, to share a little bit more on the human-related factors in preparing for factories of tomorrow. Addressing the talent and training issues as Singapore moves towards a national I-4.0 strategy. I would like to invite the speakers to do a quick self-introduction of themselves and quick comments of what I-4.0 means to them. First up, may we have Peter Pei, Central Functions and Head at Bosch Rex Roth Training Center. Peter, please. Uh, Peter, you are muted. Okay. Yeah, yeah can you hear me? Huh? Wei Ming. Thanks, yeah. Wei Ming. Okay, my name is Peter. I'm heading the new Bosch Restro Regional Training Center, or BRTC in short, uh, which is located at the new Innovation District. Uh, this is also a joint initiative with uh, Skill Future Singapore, JTC, uh, Singapore Poly, and Singaporean German Chamber of Industry and Commerce. A bit of, uh, about us. Okay, Bosch is the German MNC, which is about close to 400,000 people, company. We have many different divisions, and we, Bosch Extrop is the industrial arm of Bosch, providing drive solution to the industry through the transformation of mobile machinery with IoT, connected hydraulics, and last but not least, shaping the realizations of the visions of the factory of the future in the factory automation space. Uh, that's why we also consider ourselves as the lead provider and lead user in the advanced manufacturing and I 4.0 expect with close to more or more than 250 manufacturing plants worldwide. I think with this framing, I pass over to you for the next speaker introduction. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Now, may we have uh, Mr. Stephen Tan, uh, Center Director, Advanced Manufacturing Center at Singapore Polytechnic. Uh, Stephen, please. Yeah, afternoon to everyone. Uh, welcome to this SG Innova event. Okay, I'm Stephen Tan here, Center Director of Advanced Manufacturing Center in Singapore Poly. Uh, okay, my, a, a big background myself, actually in the factory automations uh, from the industry for the past 30 years, I'm doing automations into the precision engineering. I was from the semiconductor industry, then moving on into the consumer electro, electronic and the general automation. Right, so with this background, I mean, I came into SP or Singapore Poly 
that's part of I mean educating and actually how to actually transform our youth and in current age of the industry 4.0, which a lot of disruptive technology is. I think it's very key that we train our, our youth for the future of tomorrow or the factory of tomorrow. So be, besides training of the youth, I think all the education institution right now, I think we do a lot of the continual education and training for the industry people. And not just on that, we are, we are doing a lot actually in collaboration with the industry, like what Peter had mentioned. Uh, we actually, SP collaborate with uh, Bosch Restaurant very closely. That's one of our key partner. And on top of that, we also work with others, uh, partners, technology providers. So these are the things we do. Like I said the full-time uh, students, the, the industry, part-time students, and also working with industry. I think, all right, there's, there's a big background. Yeah, thanks, Wing. Thank you, Stephen. Now, last but not least, can we have Dr. Bertil Brandon, Strategic Development Director, Advanced Remanufacturing and Technology Center, ARTC for short, at ASTAR for introductions, please. Uh, okay. Dr. Bertil, please. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here. So ARTC is uh, it's a consortium of 85 companies that uh, basically share the cost of, of developing new technologies in advanced manufacturing. And of course, digitalization is one of the technologies we, we, look, we look at. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only we develop uh, new technologies together with our members, but we also uh, do training. And uh, we have worked uh, in the past together with Singapore Poly to jointly develop training and, and, and work together in, in the community. The important uh, aspect is, is this uh, consortium, this public-private partnership, which allows company to work together and build an ecosystem that is very conducive to developing new technologies. And, uh, and um, uh, the main point is that these companies have the same kind of problems, the same attitude towards uh, technology development. And it's a very good way to look at new, new uh, developments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bertio. Now, so like what uh, Dr. Bertio has mentioned, you know, having different people coming together, having the ecosystem coming together to drive innovations and, and uh, technology developments. Now, but of course, to when we talk about bringing uh, the entire ecosystem together, there's also definitely the people factors, which is why we are talking about the whole uh, talent training and, and, and reskilling measures that we have in Singapore to, to help people move on to the next phase in industry I point, uh, in I4.0. Now, perhaps uh, we can kickstart the entire discussion for today and we can now perhaps set the, 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 the base for the discussion by understanding a little bit more about the entire talent landscape in Singapore. Now, I'd just like to ask our speakers over here, you know, I mean, in your own, own thoughts, uh, feel free to chime in uh, whenever you, you, you feel like it, is that, you know, which areas in the whole I4.0 ecosystem do you think is uh, rapidly growing? And uh, where do you think there is a great need in, in, uh, for talent or workers to be trained in? Is it on the, the digital side or, or is it on, on the, uh, the knowledge gap is there a knowledge gap that, that people are, do not know where to operate machineries, advanced machineries, etc.? Where do you think uh, that these are the areas that are rapidly growing and need people to be in? Uh, perhaps, uh, may I ask Peter, would you like to share some of your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, can hear me too, right now? Let me see. Yeah. Okay. Am I? Okay. Uh, first, I uh, would like to also, uh, you know, uh, understand what is the, the Singapore landscapes and the ecosystem here. And, and, and all of us knows that actually today, up to now, manufacturing is still remaining a key pillar of our economy, all right, accounting for about 20%, 20 percent, 20 plus percent of the national GDP. I would say, uh, you know, based on our company, uh, you know, customer portfolio and uh, the dealing with our customers, SME in uh, driving the adoption of advanced manufacturing. And that's where uh, Bosch Threshold Regional Training Center is also, you know, set, uh, set up for this purpose. I, I would say there are still, still a diverse based industry here in Singapore. And of course, uh, the key industry sectors 
uh, that are still relevant will be, of course, semiconductors, uh, aerospace. And more important is the due to COVID that we see uh, you know, over the last year, biomedical sciences are up and coming, including food industry. So I would say uh, 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 the country itself recognize all this and from our EDB, from our various stakeholders in government, uh, that this is, 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 is important for us, you know, uh, in driving this I-4 point, the whole I-4 point zero ecosystem. That's why, you know, back 2019, when the government announced the, the establishment of this uh, uh, Jurong Innovation District, we understand that uh, over the next decade, we are in need of about close to 90, uh, there will be a creation of close to 90,000 jobs. That was the statistics from government. And there's a need for up to 32,000 talents in Jurong Innovation District itself. And you know, in GID, we have uh, the first uh, Shimano uh, advanced uh, uh, smart factory outside Japan. We have the, you know, the Hyundai Innovation Center, so forth and so forth. So I think like what we mentioned, talents uh, is something that the government is looking into. And uh, you know, with BRTC supporting this initiative to try the, the adoption of advanced manufacturing, uh, which is, you know, uh, is, is, is really in great needs, I would say. Yeah, that's my, my comment. Yeah. I mean. uh, Stephen, would you like to add on? Yeah, uh, I think in this uh, age of the industry 4.0 or the disruptive technology that comes in, I think key thing is still the manpower. I think that's why I think uh, EDB our country, SSG and everyone is putting a lot of emphasis on talent development, training yeah. the, from the youth and also retraining of the current uh, worker. It's very, it's a very, very different landscape from years, the previous year or the when I was in, in the, uh, working in the industry, you can have one, one man to one machine. Not now, maybe it's about one man to three, one man to five machines. And you actually going into the, let's say, the title of to, today, factory of tomorrow. Maybe you talk about autonomous, manless type of unmanned factory operation. So keeping technologies, let's say industry 4.0, I think a, a number of key technologies. So which one, which way to actually focus on I think it's still very much important is on the industry, the company itself, which operation are at. Everyone is actually at different levels, different stage. And mm -hmm. you, are, you allowed me to bring in, I think, EDB actually appointed to suit to come up with the series with the Smart Industry Readiness Index. That is a very good framework where you talk about having understanding your own, own company processes then you actually look at what are technology to come in to help this. Technology is an enabler and never forgetting every, a lot of companies out to keep the talent development which is under the organization side. So this is the whole ecosystem that is needed. You need the manpower, you need the equipment, the technology coming in and a whole ecosystem to support the horizontal supply chain and the vertical integration of that. Yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned about the equipment and then the manpower support. Maybe let's get back to that later. But I would like to ask uh, Dr. Badil, do you have anything on to, to add on on the areas where, you know, which, which areas do you think the whole I4.0 ecosystem is growing and uh, which areas do you think there will be a, a greater need for talent and workers to be trained at? So, so I think um, this uh, digitalization and industry 4.0 is, is a continuation. I mean, my background is automation. So it's been over the time as is uh, really developed. But now what we have is that we have uh, very fast computers, very cheap uh, sensors, uh, cheap, uh, you have cloud computing, you have artificial intelligence, you have a number of technologies that have developed so fast and so far that you can use them together in a very smart way. What is important is, uh, as Stephen said, is not just look at the technology themselves and the training in that, but digitalization will be successful if you look at the processes. So this is the organization, how the business is run, but how the manufacturing is run, the manufacturing process. And, and these have to be updated uh, for digitalization purpose, but have to be before you update them, you have to make sure they are safe, they are good, they're safe, they do what they should do. Uh, to digitalize a bad process doesn't help anybody. <laughs> it actually could make things worse. 
that's uh, number one aspect. Then you have two parts that support this process. And on one side is the technology. And of course, digitalization plays a very important role. And the last one, which is maybe the most important is really the people. So you need to, to do these three things in, in parallel. And this is exactly what uh, Siri uh, is, is suggesting is say, understand where you are according to your business processes, your technology and your people, and then make the changes according to where you want to go. But uh, it is very, very important that we create this awareness and this, this uh, training on all three aspects, because if you only do one, alone it will not succeed or very likely will not succeed and that's that's the thing very very important that people understand and uh, edb together with two suite have done this fantastic job with other members as well to develop this uh, series which is a very good way to start the, your digitalization uh, journey so of course what we are hearing from all three speakers is definitely the point that you know having the the the, the individuals themselves equipped with uh, the capabilities of uh, the knowledge of I4.0 related technologies is definitely not enough. I mean, if, uh, you will need the, the factories, the, the corporates themselves to do a complete uh, evaluation. Of course, with, with, uh, you can use the tools like Siri to evaluate uh, the, the readiness, the, the current ability in order to move on to the next stage so that um, there is an efficient transition uh, to adopt this level of technologies. But of course, um, I think uh, there was automation, the whole notion of automation has been uh, uh, mentioned a few times. There's you know, the digital uh, automation and also machine automation in terms of uh, trying to drive production and EU at factories, etc. Now, uh, I'd just like to touch a little bit more on uh, the whole concept because I think there's this whole, I would like to address the idea where people think that if factories move towards this level of uh, digital and machine automation, uh, there will come a day where um, there will no longer be humans at factories. Machines will take over uh, uh, human jobs. So I, I would just like to address this, this level of misconception uh, for our audience that might that is looking at this first. So, uh, you know, the whole robots replacing humans as, as factories move towards a greater level of uh, automation, what is the significance of uh, the importance in training and reskilling people that will machines really end up replacing all the works to be done by humans? Uh, I, I see Dr. Bertil smiling over there. So would you like to start first to give us your thoughts? Look, I don't think so. Uh, humans are fantastic because of the flexibility and intelligence and the way they can react to very difficult situations which are difficult to understand by machines. Uh, for now, and also I think for the longer term. Uh, I think machine learning and machine intelligence will, can be applied to particular topics extremely well, but this, uh, the, general, the general problems are very difficult to assess, and I think people are fantastic for this. So uh, I don't think you will have, a, you will have a soon a situation where you have no, no people. Uh, you will still need the maintenance, and uh, you will need a, a, a dog to guard the premises. Uh, this is a typical joke. So yeah, you'll have the maintenance guys and uh, the dog, uh, the guard dog. But I, I don't think it will go there uh, because uh, humans are very, very smart, very flexible and can do things better and faster. So that's, that's not, but what we can see is that this um, digitalization and new technology can supplement and can help the, the humans work better. Uh, giving them uh, more information or more accurate information or more uh, information that is more to the point to make a decision. Uh, for example, we, we have a, a, a control center at the RTC uh, and we provide data, we have dashboard, but as soon as a problem happens on the shop floor, then we have a warning that says, would you like to do something about it? If you don't do anything, uh, we run a simulation on the impact of that incident on production. And so this is another way to look at it. It's not telling you, hey, uh, this is happened, what you want to do, but if you don't do anything, this could be the consequences. So it gives you a better information to, to make a better decision. So this is something that 
I think is very nice, very positive and complementary to, to what we have. Uh, of course, you need that humans um, are able to deal with technology. So the user interfaces, the computers, and so all of this has to come. Uh, for some people, it's not easy. But I think uh, slowly, slowly, people are, have been uh, you know, used to use a mobile phone. Many years ago, people say, no, I don't want to do it. Now, every, almost everybody, many, many people have smartphones and don't have issues with that. So I think the, this is the way it, it's going to look. I, I see as a positive change, not as a negative change. Of course, you need to update and maintain yourself up to speed with, with what is happening in the technology. Yeah, definitely. And that's where the entire uh, reskilling processes and, and, and training centers over at uh, Boss Rexroth uh, does and also at SP. So uh, Peter and Stephen, would you like to, to add on, on on this entire misconception as well? Yeah, maybe allow me a uh, waving. Uh, just to share even internally at Bosch. All right. Uh, you know, Bosch, we have uh, more than 250 large manufacturing plants worldwide. And uh, in fact, uh, Bosch had the visions that you know, in, in, in by 2024, 2025, we have all our products either uh, AI, uh, AIoT enabled or produced by AIoT machines. And even, even that, uh, right, uh, what we are trying to, uh, what Bosch is trying to say is that in I4.0, people are the key player. In fact, we have identified seven features of I4.0 internally under Bosch, and people are the centric of these seven features. Because real-time data and uh, other uh, informations will not take away people's power to, to decide. And the responsibility will lies on the, on the human being, on the people itself. But they will support us by providing relevant information, like what Dr. Bilti had mentioned, in real time, and able us to make decisions uh, continuously, improving the people's freedom to decide. You know, all this, all this uh, uh, the freedom and talk about all this, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in worldwide, in, especially in Europe country, all right? Uh, the digital and analog systems, of course, will support the people better than ever. And of course, uh, with these automations and I4.0, they can take over dangerous or difficult tasks. And I, I heard just now Dr. Bershim mentioned about, or Wei mentioned about the, the human machine collaboration. This, is, this will increase safe and impurity wave of, uh, of, uh, of Working and of course, uh, what we what we are trying to also say internally that machine will continue to play uh, a subordinate role, right? So this is the. Uh, but I want to summarize: people is still the key player uh, and centric under I four point zero. That's what internally we are also driving. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Back to you. Okay, may I, maybe I just uh, in I. Okay, it actually made me recall when I was in the, as a system integrator, I mean, many, two, three decades ago, when you talk about automations, I was, as a system integrator, when I go to the factory, company asked me to look at their operation, it has a place to automate, is there a possibility to mechanize? And you can see that on the line, the productivity increased tremendously because all the operators starting to do things at a good speed because they are worried about I mean, you come in, you replace their job and all this. So this is exactly the same things we are seeing right now. Uh, you talk about industry 4.0, digitalization, sensorization, people say, will my job be replaced? Will I be made redundant? I think the key thing about this uh, fourth revolution or, or I4.0, you are talking about, I mean, bring in the value, value chain moving up the worker to a different level altogether. We are not needing an operator as per the operator today. The operator today will become an operator plus plus or a technician or a higher level skill. Where that's why the training, retraining, and all these courses is not just main of courses, but meaning mean to actually bring them to a different level. And earlier I said, is it human are not needed? I think we, we look at it now. They talk about customization. You talk about personalization, you talk, talk about order of one. These are the things that you can't make with a full automation line. A full automation line will be too expensive and too inflexible to make the changes for a small batch or an order of one. So these are the things, what you say is human are still part of the ecosystem at this current age. I mean, like what have been shared by Dr. Bertil and Peter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I guess there's general there's a general consensus, you know, like humans is definitely required. But uh, for the fear of having your job replaced and and, and and this kind of thing, I think it's it's a matter of uh, the whole requirement to be constantly upgraded and, and catching up with technology. I mean, if you look at uh twenty years twenty years ago twenty years ago, uh, you don't really see a lot of uh, smartphones. On, on the streets, you, no one even thought that smartphones can be used to, to make payments, etc. But today, using your phone, as watching your videos on the move, paying payments, it's all being about, you know, keeping up to date, which is why there's really a need for, for reskilling in order to not to be so-called outdated um, in, in, in the manufacturing industry. So perhaps now I'll just do a, a shift, a, a dive into uh, those existing uh, reskilling programs and uh, more individualistic uh, questions in which uh, our, uh, audience may ask or that um, people might be a little bit more concerned about. Perhaps uh, the, the first question I will just be directing to Peter. You know, when we talk about um, learning challenges, you know, faced by workers, students or professionals when, when they are taking like the entry level course uh, for I for zero with uh, BRTC. Um, could you could you share uh, perhaps you know what what kind of uh, problems have had these uh, uh, students uh, or, or workers face so far when they take up? Do they find it hard to catch up, or do they find whatever they have learned not being able to apply back at where they are working at or even as a student? Okay, uh, we mean uh, maybe before the diving into your questions, I also can, uh, uh, you know, uh, agree with what Stephen had mentioned earlier. I mean, both myself and Stephen are all mechanical engineers. And like in this uh, learning challenge, even for myself, you know, as a mechanical engineer, when we are embarking on this I4.0 journey, the digitalization uh, journey, it is it's sometimes quite a daunting task or a challenge for, for us, you know, to pick up skills in a, a network, basic networking database, and which is a dinosaur to us. So this is even for myself is the learning challenge, not talking about uh, you know, the students in our center. But I do get uh, several feedbacks. All right? uh, in, uh, before that, I also can also add that in, our, in, in the participants that I've met, they are uh, students that they just graduate from university that join our training or current engineers or workers that are at the age of 65 years old. My, 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 the, the eldest the participant in my training center that I've seen is about 65, 66 years old, and a couple of them learning this new uh, I4.0 technology. So, you know, uh, I, I, I face uh, I, what we saw, myself and Stephen, we saw quite a number of this group of uh, 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 students uh, that uh, joined the course. And they, they mentioned to me, uh, if I remember vividly, that uh, one of them said, it's like a crash course for me, you know. Uh, over two, two days or one day, you know, I need to acquire certain skills in, 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 in doing dashboarding, understanding what smart sensor, you know, what it does, how to connect them to uh, my IoT gateway and then put it up on the dashboard. But I get good feedback that they say, uh, which although it's a challenge they face that the duration is too short, uh, it's too difficult for them to learn so much and I'm trying to catch up. Uh, but we have seen improve some of these, uh, we mean. but again, uh, I would say uh, uh, these are some of the challenges faced by the participant. Uh, uh, they could sometimes underestimate the cost prerequisite. Therefore, uh, together with SP, we have also launched a prep one day course, right? That the, the, the student come in to understand the essentials of basic networking, database, web application uh, that are required for advanced manufacturing. All right. Uh, even some of us, including myself, uh, are, are, are taking up this journey, taking up these courses to, to, to embark on this I4.0 journey. Like exactly Dr. Bertil mentioned, it's a journey, right? It's a never earning lifelong uh, a journey, yeah. even for myself and Stephen. Wiming, back to you. Yeah. Hey, Wiming, you are muted now. Yeah, I didn't realize that was on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, definitely the the also question you know when we talk about when there's there's always the good part and 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 the bad part when you go through the reskilling uh, journey, but what if you know that whatever you do you learn when you take it back to uh, 
back to back to your workplace yeah. and you realize that there's actually no place where you can practice or sort of uh, make use of this knowledge there is always a fear that you know whatever you learn may once again become obsolete you have you have the drive that you want to be upskilled but yet factories are not taking it mm. so how can you encourage you know this con- the workers to continue to, to upskill themselves at the mm. same time um, bring uh, manufacturers, companies together to also organizational level upgrade themselves. So I think this this is more maybe more towards uh, Dr. Bertil. In you know you know you know an opinion you know how can manufacturers at the same time develop you know those this new innovation technologies along with the upskilling program that uh, people are taking up. Is there any strategies that manufacturers can adopt as an answer apart from the points that has been mentioned earlier in terms of the self-evaluation with uh, like Siri and all? Uh, what, what else are, can they able to do in order to, to better link up the reskilling process as well as their own internal upgrading technological process? Mm. So I, I think the, the, the top of the organization must be trained as well. It's not just the, the worker who, who executes, but you need the, the management to be aligned with the digitalization and understand what, what it means. Because if, if they are not aligned and they don't take it seriously, uh, just it will, not, it will not work because they will not give the right signal. It will not give the right uh, support to the people, to their teams. So it, it must be very clear to, to the a whole organization and maybe starting with the management, what it means and what are the difficulties. The difficulties are very big and that's why not so many companies are successful. You need to do this in three ways. Yeah, as I mentioned in the beginning, the, the processes uh, and then the technology and the people. If you don't look at the processes in, in parallel with the rest, et cetera, it will, it will not work very well. So. This is a, a, a management decision. They need to understand what it means and, and what are the consequences for themselves and for the whole organization. So if I want to, to do something like this, um, first, uh, this is my experience, what I observe is that you need to, to have the, the top management to understand what it means. So you may need to have a training for them initially. Maybe it's not uh, very long, but it's uh, one or two days where you explain the challenges, the consequences, the requirements for, for the whole organization. And once they, they, have, uh, they have this, then what it will be very useful is to see companies that have been successful, like a lighthouse example. You have a lot, number of companies that have been very successful like Bosch uh, worldwide, and they have factories that have digitalized and they are very efficient, very effective. And, and uh, these are examples. So to see an example, it can be either in a company or it can be a test bed such as Rexroth has or Singapore Poly has, or we have. I find the test beds uh, very, very um, um, convincing because you see how things work and what is actually possible. So. An example we have is a is a industry 3.0 line for assembly of a gearbox for marine application. Absolutely nothing is special. And then we ask the question, what does it take to digitalize? And then we say, okay, we can put a cobalt. We can put a mat that tells me if in a particular cell people are there. Then I have availability. I measure the speed and then I measure the quality. Or, and right away I have overall equipment effectiveness. This is a measurement, uh, is a way to measure how, how well a, a manufacturing system works. So you can have uh, small, small uh, uh, things like this that, that are extremely effective and, and um, really helpful in convincing. Then the other part, which is very important, is, is the following. Once you do the training, the training has to be done in a way that you apply while you are training and possibly you apply after the training because only by doing it yourself, and this is the question that you had, what if I don't have a a way to apply it? If I don't have a case study where I can apply it and really understand and make it happen myself, 
uh, is not going to be as effective. So one or two of our members have done this. So they asked to, to develop some training for, for them to train the trainer in, in digitalization. And one of the things we said is that every team that comes there needs to have a project that they will execute after. They, they will specify during the training and they will execute in the months after. And then we uh, support with people that have experience, such as us all around the table here or, or other people, we support uh, while they are developing it and, and say, okay, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Uh, in my experiences did not work, but this could work. So by having somebody to guide them along the journey, they will learn. And this learning will be positive, will be successful, and then they will repeat. The, the worst case is to do two things. One is to take too big of a problem, too big of a digitalization, then you, <laughs> very challenging to make happen, or do it without the guidance of somebody who has done it before. Uh, and this is extremely helpful. Then you have a positive, uh, a positive uh, result and you want to do more. So I think that's uh, my, my suggestions or, or my, my experience in, in how to look at digitalization. And it works very well if you do it this way. Which, which I would just like to emphasize on one of the points that has been made earlier. I mean, it's the whole interaction of the whole of the ecosystem, right? Be it on the organizational level, the top down and the bottom up uh, knowledge reskilling, and and also as if there's an ecosystem. I mean, you can see what other corporates are doing, are what doing. other people are doing, in order to really absorb the knowledge of the benefits that the entire digital education will bring. And at the same time, bringing that knowledge back and how to apply it. And at the time of the application, your workers will really be ready by then, you know, um, to to implement these changes. Now we have talked about. Um, organization level, the management side, as well as existing working professionals. Now, maybe uh, I'll just bring the attention towards uh, the, the, the younger generation, which means uh, youth, students. I mean, we are just now Stephen has mentioned as well. So I just want to pose the question over to Stephen, you know. Currently in the IHL setting, right, is, is the whole interest for I4.0 related technologies, is the interest there is there a, a growing one or is there a declination or, or what? How, how do you see the current uh, youth take towards i4.0 strategies and, and, and uh, technologies? Yeah, I, I think uh, to bring this point, I think in the context, I would say it's not referring just to an education institution per se. The education uh, institution, you look at that is just one part of the whole equation. Is, I mean, now I'm going to push is previously, I mean, we can work alone, but the push right now is how can an institution actually work with an industry? I think that is very key of that. So to able to, I mean, understand the industry, how can, how we can bring back, what are the relevancy, the skill set, the, the basic expectation and requirement of industry, and we bring it back to our classroom. And in fact, in South Poly, we actually, co-created a learning journey together, I mean, like I said, with the industry partner, even with Bosch Restaurant, with ARTC, with a number of companies. We create a learning journey to let, I mean, not only our students understand for the industry. So it, it, that's where, I mean, you see, you, you the awareness is must begin from young. That's where the institution from school, all this. And with the push of this, the awareness there, that's how, I mean, our students actually will come to any get the interest up on that. And we actually have quite a good ecosystem, but doesn't mean good ecosystem, you have all the fancy food equipment. I mean, fancy food equipment are so-called uh, for the lab, for showcase, for display, but how you can make use of equipment and put it relevant to use to the industry. And we have been mentioning about digitalization, sensorizations, how you're able to make a legacy system. Legacy system can't alive and able to extract the information. These are the key thing. And we can see that students are getting more in, interested in all this. And you talk about, last time we talked about industrial robot. Now we talk about cobot. I mean, collaborative robot, where the robot can work together with a human and you, there's no barriers so-called in that. So these are the things that I think more and more of the students, the youth of today, are keen into it. 
and the soft skill, the hard skill all comes in together. You can't have a very silo type of effect. So what we call it, the holistic education enable them to be, I mean, the workforce of tomorrow. So does this um, exposure uh, come in, in the form of just simply um, internships or is there like usually a, a follow-up, like once upon graduation, are they able to uh, find a place to, to apply some of these skills or, or how, how are there, how is SP is able to further uh, help these students um, to, to be able to ensure that they are within this whole uh, the, the core of the I4.0 workforce? Yeah, I, I think if there are a good point about, I mean, earlier you thought internship and things like that. This is currently, I think like I said, in the education system, a lot has been moved. Last time we talked about maybe just doing a final year project per se. But right now, I mean, it, uh, there are a lot of emphasis actually placed on internship. How we actually intern. That's why the industry partners are very important. We are, we are not talking last time, just sending out for four weeks, eight weeks, and then just get them attached to a company to put in their resume. But right now, we're talking about internship with a purpose. And we also having, I mean, different form, different tiers of internship. And in SP, in the, in the center, Advanced Mechanical Center, we also having what we call a solution interns. That means these are these are the interns that we can actually train them together with our partners uh, to equip them and they can actually deliver solution. That's part of it within SP and some of the company, we actually can work with them to identify their project and our students, if they can actually, in a way, mentor our students, they can deliver or our staff can come in together to work with students to come up with a viable solution for the company and no longer just attachment for the sake of attachment, but attachment and intern for a purpose. Yeah. So you see the entire conversation centered around whether or not you know, the entire reskilling, is it I just go to a course, get the paper and then that's it. This is really about being able to, to sufficiently apply, learn and apply and, and really understand uh, what you're doing and be equipped, you know, so that you are ready for life. So the same thing that I want to apply, I mean, the same question that I want to apply to both Dr. Patil and uh, Peter as well. If, were there any sub examples that, that, that you can share with, with our audience here, you know, like uh, examples where the reskilling programs has been good use, where the graduates were able to apply uh, what they learn in settings outside of their as of their current workspace. Yeah. So, well, Peter, maybe you would like to go first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, I must also uh, uh, okay. Just now, mention, Dr. Bertil mentioned about top management. I also must say that the top management commitment is very important. And uh, you know, BRTC we run the the first uh, industrial specialist German industrial specialist I four point zero training. Uh, in BRTC, the second country outside Germany that's running this recognized the German curriculum uh, I 4.0 course. And uh, the, the first, first inaugural run we had in June, uh, we, we had a German company that actually sent three of their engineering uh, departments, uh, engineer, including the managers to our course. And, and the reason I got to know that uh, why this company have sent three, you know, including the manager for this uh, specialist program was actually from the management. The management of this company uh, see the importance of reskilling. And after the, after the course, they go back and implement large scale I4.0 project in the company. So I would say this is one success uh, as a, a successful example. But I also want to share there are, there are two good examples within our organization. All right. Uh, first was uh, my current I4.0 applica application engineer who, who first joined us last year under this uh, Skill Future United Traineeship Program as a trainee. But as a trainee himself, he went through several training programs in our center. And not only he, after the trainee demonstrate uh, the majority of applying his I4.0 skill uh, uh, in the test bed project or POC project under BRTC, working with our senior engineers, uh, with our with, uh, implementing POC project uh, at 12 SME organization, Child of it uh, over the last one year. 
and, and we see uh, this, this uh, very uh, strong skill that uh, demonstrated by him. And since then, uh, we have committed, we have we actually uh, uh, converted him to a full time staff, uh, right? After seeing uh, uh, the, the demonstration of the skills at the maturity of his, uh, of his uh, you know, uh, you know, of his, uh, what do you call that, uh, attitude, working attitude. And in fact, he is now enrolled in our management training program, <laughs> all right? From, from a trainee, right? And the second example I want to share here is that uh, we are also working with IT under this uh, 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 work study diploma program, whereby you know the, the IHL attached the students under this this WSD program to our company for two and a half years, doing part time uh, apprenticeships and also going back to school and study. And and under uh, this 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 concept, they work with our I four point zero technologies. They acquire the necessary skill swiftly and they support the implementation of some of our company project. And these projects are in the hundreds of thousands, huh? in the hundreds of thousands and million dollars. And, the, and these students actually are able to demonstrate the skills that they acquire, of, of trained by the senior I4.0 technology and implement it into the, the tasks that are being assigned. So these are the successful uh, you know, uh, examples that I could share, even within our organization. Yeah. When, yeah. That's a, that's a, I like the part, you know, where it's really not about the, sometimes it's not about the, the, the channels and avenues that you're able to practice, but also when you go through such rescaling program, it's the opportunities, right. yeah. un, I would say unexpected opportunities that, that you may create for, uh, for yourself when you're every time going through a constant upgrading uh, of yourself in the journey of learning. So Dr. Berthu, uh, would you like to, to continue to, to add on, on on the part for like, with ARTC trainings, uh, is there any other examples that you're able to share with, uh, with everyone here that um, there, there are channels to ensure that the, the skills learned will, will be applied so that it, it get the better registered, uh, be better registered and, and things like that? Would you yes. like to add on? Um, so the, the examples we have are more with, with our own industry. We have um, students that come and work at ARTC and so on or, or go to our members, but maybe the example is when, when uh, uh, one or more of our members decide, okay, we want to go on the digitalization um, they, the journey, um, and then we, we first introduce them to what is digitalization, what is Siri, and then we make sure that the teams that maybe come from different plans come with challenges that they want to digitalize. So examples of digitalization. And, and we, we ask them to work on on defining the problem statement, what is the value creation? Because it's very easy to say I digitalize, but if it doesn't bring any value, then how is that going to help the company? So that's another aspect that's very important is it, what is really the value? And uh, it's not just a saving in cost, but it's maybe improvement in availability, in speed, in quality, in health and safety, in energy consumption. So what would that digitalization project result in? And, and then once we know this being defined fairly systematically, we say, okay, please uh, work with it with the support of your management so that the management knows what they're doing. And I'll see you in two weeks and I'll see you in two weeks after that. And by doing this very simple type of, of, uh, of check in the two weeks and give feedback on what they're doing, it seems to go to really help and it has resulted in, in a number of successful digitalization projects at the site. And, and then they can go on onto the next, onto the next, onto the next. But this is a way to uh, maybe is to, to take them by, by the hand, but not that much, but really help them through this journey. If you go on your own, it's overwhelming. You can do so many things. Digitalization can go from all the way to the sensor, all the way to, to with the cloud. What do you want to do and why? And this concept of bringing the digitalization aspect together with the value for, for the company or the, for that line is very important because it makes it practical and it gains the support of your management. If you can show, hey, uh, I'm going to be able to produce, uh, I don't know, 20% more or 15% more, whatever it is, uh, your management is going to look good and they're going to support you. So that's uh, simple, simple, practical stuff. But 
very effective. So we try to, to, to help the students in this way. Okay. Thank you, Donna Patio. All right. So uh, looking at the time now, I mean, we have uh, 10 minutes left. Maybe I'll just use this time to address uh, some of the questions from the ground. Now, apart from the uh, Q&A sec uh, Q box, uh, I, I've seen some questions that's actually listed uh, in the chat group that, that, that has not been uh, up on the, the, the Q&A box. But uh, before that, maybe I'll just do a quick shout out uh, for our audience here. If there's any questions to any of our speakers, uh, please feel free to just use the Q&A box at the bottom panel of your screen to, to post them. Yeah, so um, I have seen uh, a question within the chat itself that, that actually says this, uh, like for a setup for, uh, that, that, that most small machine shops in Singapore may have, you know, does it make economical sense if say you have like less than five machines and less than five employees, is there value to still adopt digitalization? So what's your take on that? Um, given given a, a small small setting, you know, you have limited number of machines, limited number of workers, what what is the value in in in, in going towards digitalization? So if I because I talked about value, maybe I can I can jump in before before my, my colleagues. Uh, it depends. It really depends what you want to achieve and, and, and you need to do a calculation. What is the value creation? So are you looking after uh, improved availability, improved qu uh, quality, improved speed? Do you want to improve your health and safety, your energy consumption? What, what's your headache? What, what are you trying to do? And digitalization is a means to that. And so once you, you, you know what you want to do, then you can say, okay, how do I change my process? How do I change my technology? How do I train my people to make sure that this process functions properly and brings me the value that I want. So uh, I think it is a very good question and they just need to go through the steps of understanding what is value creation for them. Even if it's a small organization, it might be very, very worthwhile uh, just by improving health and safety, for example. Uh, so it's really a question of, of uh, looking at that in a, in a systematic way and then making the steps. I don't know what my colleagues think. Stephen, would you like to add on? Stephen or? Stephen or? Uh, okay, Peter, Peter okay. or? Uh, oh, Peter, okay, I, I think like I said, um, is, is you talk about different factory, different operations have different needs. Uh, doesn't mean that you are becoming a small company, uh, I mean, it, this, I mean, industry 4.0 has a role that you can you can actually utilize harness technology. Uh, key thing about that, I mean, you, you're going to the Siri or going to any platform, doesn't mean that all the company you have to reach to the highest level. That's, that's one key thing. You talk about a, a small company with five machines, with five uh, worker. Key thing to look at that, what are the current bottleneck? What are the current inefficiency of the operation? You talk about, I mean, digitalization, you talk about uh, some of the uh, key part of the issue of traceability, how you actually inventorize your process, how you actually create the paperless. These are the value add into that. I think it's not just looking at any specific technology, but looking at, I mean, getting back to the Siri, process technology and your organization. Process first, understand the whole process, look at that what you think you can actually reduce the inefficiency, how you actually improve, improve the productivity and how you make use of the right technology. Doesn't mean you have to include all the latest technology. I think step by step, uh, like I think I heard a uh, little but uh, Dr. Batu was mentioning, you, I mean, sometimes you can't get it alone. A training, uh, uh, at the end of course, maybe make you a bit more aware. You can't be an expert in a one, two, or a five-day course, but make you aware of what are the possibility, make you aware of what you can do, and then are you able to write, find a right partner or solution solution provider that come along and implement for you these uh, place that you can actually enhance your operation. I, I will say on that. 
I just to add on to Stephen's comment here is that, and I also agree to Dr. Perkyu, is that it's, it's never uh, uh, you know, a, a, a challenge to start a small project, be it uh, only one machine. Take for example, only I can also share uh, within our organization, uh, you know, when our uh, uh, regional president was uh, here, he, he actually uh, uh, stirred up us to stir us up to actually implement some I 4.0 project in our shop floor. You know, monitoring, uh, you know, small machine monitoring the the you know the room uh, humidity. You know, uh, so that uh, we understand whether the, the room that store our important products. Are they well controlled uh, ambience temperature? So, uh, and with all this, uh, like what uh, Stephen mentioned, learning itself is without applying it is only halfway there, right? And then to apply it, and then you need a, a, a some kind of project uh, or to turn a legacy machine smarter. So all this, I would say, add value definitely add value to not only individual as a person, as an engineer, technicians, but also as a nation as a whole, that we know we, in our government, want to drive the adoption of advanced manufacturing. And in the end, in five years or 10 years from now, when we look back, if we have not started any project, be it a small machine or one machine, how can we stay competitive and solidify Singapore competitive as the as, 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 as a strong manufacturing base here? And, you know, uh, we want to continue to, to remain as the preferred investment uh, destination in this region. That's why I think all, all it is being driven by EDB, SSG, and all the initiatives that we had. I think as a nation, we must move forward. And what we Ming mentioned, the whole whole talent gaps and the reskilling and upskilling. Yeah. Yep. So all in all, I guess there's definitely no, you know, one size fits all solution. It's, it's really depending on what uh, such uh, small small machine shops or organization is actually looking at in order to really determine what is value. Now, maybe uh, moving on, uh, perhaps some, some of these questions is more towards uh, maybe your advisors, you know. So we have someone asking, as a current mechanical engineering student, you know, how can I prepare, start preparing myself for I4.0? Maybe, Stephen, I think this might be your area. Yeah, I, I think it's from the institution part, I think that will follow on with the, the industry. Peter. I think, of course, I mean, I, I myself am mechanical engineering students uh, where I go into the factory automations. I think this, I mean, let me, I mean, along the line of industry 4.0, because you fall back on that automation is just, I mean, able to mechanize things. You have the sensors, you have all the data. But right now we talk about industry 4.0, how you actually can harness the data, interconnect the data, make connected and what is it having a common protocol where legacy systems, legacy system you actually still able to tap that. So as a mechanical engineering student, you, you can't focus on just mechanical engineering at this uh, current state. You actually have to actually get up on the digitalizations where your understanding of the whole process and of course programming skills, I mean does come apart or the knowledge of the program knowledge of big data and currently talk about traceability, we talk about all the like technology. I mean, traceability is very key thing in, in I mean, the context of the odd product. So you must be able to do like product life cycle to understand that. So a very huge area key, what is your area you are focusing on? And this, I mean, digitalization and the software part cannot run away from the industry 4.0. There's you have to equip and of course pick up courses. That's where you actually can feel yourself how is whether you have aptitude for a specific area or not. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Stephen. So maybe one last question uh, before we wrap things up. Um, I think this question is more towards uh, trying to understand, you know, the the, the differences of the, the various. Uh, I4.0 related uh, training out there by various organizations. So more specifically, uh, over here it says, uh, how can an industry 4.0 human capital initiative, the IHCI uh, enabler program and SP's industry specialist 4.0 complement or differ from one another? So in a way, I would, I would try to frame this as, how do you tell the various uh, 
training programs out there augured by different by different organizations, by SP, by, by ERTC, by ARTC. How do you select which one is the best for you? Look, look at the contents and see if there is an application at the end of it, if it's a possibility to apply. That would be my criteria. It is really a way to experiment and make it happen. Uh, so for example, SP with, with Rex Roth there, the lab, you can you can go in there and really try it and, and see that it works, you know, put stuff in the cloud and get it back and very useful stuff. So it, it can be simple, but this is really the starting. Is for me, if you can apply it as part of the course, that's very valuable. I don't know, Stephen, what you think, or Peter. Uh, that will be my, my, and uh, by the way, I'm also a mechanical engineer. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Peter and, and Stephen, would you like to comment? Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, more on towards, you know, not only selecting uh, how, which one might be best, but yeah. how do you think some of these uh, programs can actually complement each other? Yeah, I, I think I agree with what Dr. Batu said. I mean, fitting, there are a lot of programs. I think that there's no doubt about that from different institutions, different training organizations. Key, you look at what really, what is Amita lacking. If if it's possible, I think there should be a, a, a route map identifying the, the company. Where are the gaps? What is the skill level missing? Or what are the technology they have? If they can come up with a route map, they can identify the area of the, I mean, skills needed, even the lacking of, whether it's in-house development or hiring of a, a different expert coming in. And the, the training, like what the doctor put ask all those providers what they have, even the content. I mean, verify with them, question them, and see how is the, how you're able to fit. Because you have, you may have two similar programs being rolled out but the content and the execution of the training might be different. So it's good to ask, you're gonna pay, make sure you ask and get what you want. <laughs> yeah, that's it for me. Yeah, just to add on, uh, Stephen, uh, uh, BRTC is also embarking on this. I uh, Peter, you are a little soft. Yeah, hello, okay. Is it okay? Uh, still a little soft. About now? The same actually. <laughs> okay. But, but maybe you have to speak a little louder. Okay. Uh, if you can hear. Now okay. can. Now can. Yes. Okay. So actually to add on to what I mean just now about the IHCI, we, we are also uh, uh, participating this, uh, the next cohort of IHCI program just to share. All right. And of course, uh, uh, IHCI program, the difference is that they, uh, they have a structured uh, uh, over a period of time. All right, and it is also uh, have a project like what Dr. Matthew worked in the project in the company where the trainee, apart from uh, uh, attending the trainings at the BRTC, they will also be implementing a project at, the, at their company. So that is, that's the different, I mean, if they come to our center for a particular training, as I said earlier, having trained and learned a, a particular I4.0 topics, if they don't apply, there's only halfway or over time it will lost the skill will be lost. And then, you know, like what uh, Stephen mentioned, the awareness, you know, uh, didn't put in good use. But of course, uh, we have also test bit or POC and the students can actually experience and work with our machine at the center. The center will be set up and fully operational uh, toward end of the year or first quarter next year, All right? But the training are already ongoing except the full uh, BRTC activities will only be fully operational towards end of the year or uh, first quarter 2022. Yeah. All right, thank you, Peter. Hey, by and, the way, uh, before we, I forget, we mean, were the participants able to uh, reach out to us of, even after this uh, session that uh, they, they can get hold of uh, our contacts, our yep, email? We can, yeah. we, can, we can share for, for a direct link up uh, post event. So, uh, it's it's 504 now, so I think we have overrun a little bit. Uh, so perhaps I'll just wrap things up. Uh, to sum it 
Okay, so to sum our, our entire conversation for the past hour, right, I think when it comes to training, rescaling, I think we can look at it at, at, at largely, we can uh, look at it as two levels. You know, one is an organizational level, and of course, the other one is on an individual level. So, of course, the individual level, it goes with the current professionals, workers, students, etc. And organizational level is, of course, the, the management to the uh, top to bottom or bottom up. Um, it, from an organizational level perspective, it's always, it's always about uh, evaluation, self-evaluating on the existing readiness, uh, where you are at the moment and where do you want to go uh, before being able to select what's the next uh, best path for you. But before that, of course, the entire reskilling, having the knowledge, interacting with the ecosystem to see what is the most valuable out there and, and not be left out by technology. Uh, and of course, on the individual level, there is always about choosing, of course, what is best for you in wherever that you are at the moment. And uh, of course, finding avenues and opportunities to best uh, upskill yourself and um, so-called, uh, not only not, not to be left out, but at the same time, uh, make sure that these, these skills that you picked up, you have a, a place that you can showcase yourself in the whole i4.0 journey. So with that, uh, I would just like to conclude uh, today's session. I want to thank all the attendees who have uh, stayed with us uh, so far. And I would like to also represent SG Novit to thank all our speakers. Uh, big thank you to Peter, Stephen, and Dr. Bertil for all the great insights and examples shared with everyone over here. I think the examples are, 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 are things that uh, people are looking out so that they can identify themselves, identify themselves with and they better understand uh, the entire uh, training and, and reskilling perspective for as, as part of the entire Singapore I4.0 strategy. And uh, once again, back to the attendees, uh, keep a lookout for post-event mail, which will contain the recording of this session. And uh, do reach out to us at events at sgnovate.com if you would like to connect with uh, any of our speakers. And I think we will also include uh, the contact points of uh, our speakers if you'd like to reach out to them as well. Uh, that's it. Uh, do also remember to give us your post-event feedback when you exit the webinar or through the post-event mail as well. And this is Wei Min signing out from this webinar then. Uh, hope that everyone have a great day ahead. Stay safe, stay healthy in this climate. Hope to have you again in our next webinar session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.